I think when we go to scripture, and, and this is, I think, the foundation for us uh, in terms of getting our kids to do something like chores and developing a work ethic, uh, I mean, this first step is just communicate the biblical truth in your home. Communicate the Christian worldview of something like work. Mm -hmm. Hey, we want you to be aware that there is a very important event happening in September, September 8th and 9th at Frisco Bible Church in Frisco, Texas, which is kind of in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Our very first Texas Maven Conference is happening, and we got a great lineup. Uh, we are coming to Texas. We want to partner with churches and Christian schools and families in that area to really equip you with solid biblical worldview training that is also practical. So we are hoping to see a lot of you there in Texas. Yeah, and even if you don't live in the area, maybe you ought to think about making a weekend out of visiting Dallas with your spouse and spending some time really thinking about this topic of discipling your kids and how to do that well and how to navigate all the things in the culture that we have to navigate as parents. So maybe you should do a couple's weekend away. Maybe you should connect with some friends and say, hey, let's let's do a trip together and go to this conference. Even if you don't live near Dallas, maybe it's worth the investment of a weekend. So we would maybe. love to see Wait, you. You said maybe. No, it is. <laughs> don't be nice. Let's <laughs> tell these folks the truth, Aaron. We want to give them the straight truth. That's what they want. They're adults. Okay. So... so mavenconferences.com. That's where you can get all the information. This. You need to go to the website now. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are continuing our summer of the best of our greatest hits. Aaron and I could not We agree. can't agree. I think I like time. best of the Maven Parent Podcast. And I like greatest hits. Which so, makes us sound old. So anyway. we're going to put it together and say best of the greatest hits. So this one we thought would be good, especially for this time of year. It is the fall and everyone's starting to, either you've started back to school or you are doing back to school shopping. You are thinking about back to school. And so what a good time to think about the habits in our home, how to restart maybe some new habits. Or... This is, we could, you could call this the great reset. Because <laughs> I've heard a lot of people say stuff about the great reset online. Uh -huh. And aren't they referring to like, you know, going back to school and <laughs> I think doing so. a great reset? Yeah, I think they Or is are. it something, that might be something bigger. Maybe. maybe. But it, it's time to reset, right? You use uh, the new school year, you know, you're out of habits in the summer, so restart those habits. And one of a very important habit in homes is to help your kids develop a work ethic to work regularly, to contribute to the family, to give for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. And in this episode, we talk a lot about that. So enjoy this episode of four ways that you can help your kids do their chores. It's the Maven Parent Podcast. I'm Brett Kunkel, and this is my way better half. Erin Kunkel. And today we want to let you know that your kids are lazy. <laughs> and our kids are lazy. And yeah. actually, it's actually a condition that has affected humanity uh, for a long, long time, this, this uh, condition of laziness. We all struggle with laziness in various ways. And so um, we thought today we would cover four different ways to help you as a parent get your kids to work or to do chores and uh we've got some experience with this with five kids yeah lots of uh failure yes lots of successes sure yes. <laughs> not as confident on the successes <laughs> hopefully you've had some confident success. on the failures for sure well i think as parents this uh i think with our oldest daughter when she was in later elementary school and in high school, we kind of saw a, a kind of an increasing lazy, laziness um, in, in her, in resistance to work. Yeah. Not always laziness. I mean, that's yeah. kind of a very negative characterization, which there are times when our kids certainly are lazy. Yeah. But I think in addition, there's this, um, this kind of reaction against work or a negative view of work. 
Yeah, I think growing resistance is actually a good way to put it. Just as we get older, our kids have more in their lives, more activities, more things to do. So even the time spent at home and the desire to contribute at home can start to lessen for sure. Yeah. And uh, so, but one of the goals that we have as parents uh, is when our kids walk out of our house and we've kind of narrowed it down in terms of, hey, what are the key things we want our kids to walk out of our homes with? Mm -hmm. And one of those things that we want to pass on to our kids and help cultivate in them is a work ethic. Like even if my my kid doesn't get into the best uh, college or get the highest you know ACT or SAT scores, I think there's actually something that's more valuable than than those things, and that's a work ethic. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there are several things that we try to do as mom and dad to develop a healthy culture of work in our home. And uh, so we've just got four. This isn't completely comprehensive, but I think it gets us going in the right direction. Maybe we'll give you guys some some ideas as thing uh, uh, ideas for things that you can do as parents. And uh, okay, so Aaron, uh, let's go through these four things. I'm going to let you start. Uh, okay. What's what's the first thing a parent can do to develop a healthy work ethic to get their kids to do something like chores? Well, yeah, I think one thing that we have tried to instill from the beginning in our kids is that work is good. And work is something that we were made to do. It's part of uh, our nature that we that work is good for us and that it's something that God instilled in humanity before the fall. It's a pre-fall thing. So it's not because of our sin we need to work and learn these valuable things. It's actually part of our nature as co-creators with God. We are supposed to work. And I think as adults, we all kind of recognize this. Um, Well, maybe not. (laughs) (laughs) There's some adults that I don't think recognize that. Well, and there's times that we maybe resent that because we would like to have more breaks or whatever, but. I've seen that resentment in you uh, every so often, huh? so. But we all know that it brings about good in, in so many ways, but obviously in our character. Yeah, I, I think what you said, I wanna highlight what you said there about this is not a result of the fall. Like hard work is not a result of the fall. Like this is the punishment. Yeah. Uh, there is in the curse, you know, in, in Genesis 3, there is there is talk about our work becoming more toilsome and more difficult. Yeah. But I think when we go to Scripture, and, and this is, I think, the foundation for us uh, in terms of getting our kids to do something like chores and developing a work ethic, uh, I mean, this first step is just communicate the biblical truth in your home. Communicate the Christian worldview of something like work. Mm -hmm. And it starts in Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 27. After God creates man in his own image, uh, male and female, verse 28 then says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we have in God's first command is number one, Fill the earth, uh, multiply. Number two, subdue the earth, rule over it. And then in Genesis 2, we see that God, uh, I believe it's Genesis 2.15. Uh, yeah, 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Mm-hmm. So pre-fall, <laughs> before there's any sin that enters the world, God gives us a command to work and then puts uh, Adam in the garden to cultivate it, to keep it, to, to work. Mm-hmm. So uh, work is actually a good thing. Yeah, and it's a it's a dignifying thing. Okay, I unpack that a little bit more. How is, it a, how is work a dignifying thing? Um, I think in some ways just it, that we are capable of doing good, that we're capable of creating, of tending, of cultivating, you know, all these things in whatever it is the work involves. And when I think about our kids and how it's dignifying to them, 
it's it's saying to our children you you are capable of so much and you're capable what, what of being our- a part of the family and part of being a part of a family is taking care of what we have of each other all those things mm-hmm. um now what if our cap- kids aren't capable of that much what do you no. mean <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding oh. I'm using the opportunity to um tease our kids tease our children who are behind the camera there <laughs> um no i i think i think you're absolutely right and, and this is there there's a, a this a larger picture here of for all humanity yeah. is that work is a dignifying thing yeah and 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 i think when we when we start to process this a little bit more think about uh, in your job or uh, you know what you do in the home or, or wherever you have an example where you're working and you you maybe create something whether it's the cooking of a meal or whether it's working with your hands on something or whether it's gardening or whether it's creating a business and you accomplish certain things, there's a dignity that comes with mm-hmm. that. There's a, a building of one's uh, kind of confidence. And um, uh, so I think it's it, it's really good to help our kids tap into that early on that, uh, that yeah, this is a really dignifying thing. Mm-hmm. And so one one way I think maybe we can do that is by praising them when they, they do do work mm-hmm. and, and narrating for them. We talk a lot about narrating, but just mm-hmm. narrating what has happened here so for instance uh are you know uh our you, your kid does a job at home or you know one of our kids like ella will she, she likes to wash our vehicles and vacuum the vehicles for some extra to earn some extra money and uh when she does a really good job uh, it, it's it's praising her and saying wow you you really put some effort into this the, the car looks fantastic thank you ella and then you see her face kind of brighten up because there's this dignity that comes with with work Mm -hmm. um okay so along this this idea of communicating the biblical view of work as a good yeah aaron what are how does the does the culture help us with that (laughs) i was just (laughs) going to say how difficult it is to instill that message in our kids sometimes because of the culture's view is so prominent and the culture's view on work is not is not that it's good at least american culture today is that work is a pain and that as much free time and pleasurable things you can do that that will that that's better for you and that's and, actually the goal. Oh, for sure, like, for sure. So, and then I think just realizing at least we have the culture around us, our kids are oftentimes some of the only kids that I know that have a thing called chores, that that have to contribute on a daily basis to what happens here in our home. And this is in... in non-christian and christian circles there isn't a huge difference on the cultures that family have around the idea of work and chores and just contributing to your family as a member of that family yeah uh so there's there's the larger cultural views Mm -hmm. um i think that you hit on and then there's also these kind of practical things that those views get played out in culture. So on the kind of the high level, the theoretical level, kind of a worldview that says the good life is about pleasure. And that comes in the form of leisure time and wealth so that you can go to nice dinners and have nice vacations. But ultimately the goal of work, there's, you know, work is just a means to an end and the end is pleasure. And so that mitigates against work in our homes. But then very practically how that gets played out is that there are a lot of homes where, yeah, kids don't have chores. And then your kids, I mean, we, we saw this, um, we've seen this with our kids where they've said, yeah, my, my friends don't have to do chores, yeah. particularly in high school. Yeah, they have said, I don't know anyone of my friends who has chores. 
Yeah, and so uh, our home looks very different than what they're hearing and seeing from other homes. So that's some cultural pressure that uh, can creep in. And you think about how this does not prepare our kids for reality, for real life. Because you think about how many things in life are difficult and how how learning to struggle and push through things, doing things when you don't want to do them. I mean, that's the definition of parenting, right? Like we do all these things for our kids when they're little, especially that we don't want to do. We don't, we wouldn't really love to wake up in the middle of the night and change a poopy diaper and feed a baby. We don't really want to have to do all these things for our toddlers, you know, because we're, we're tired and, but we, but we learn to fight against that and push through that. And we don't want to get up for work on Monday morning, but, but we get up for work on Monday morning because we have people depending on us. So you just think about how this does not prepare kids in any way for life outside of our home. If work is not just a normal rhythm of what we do as a family. Yeah. And there's, I think there's, um, couple of different aspects to that. There is the sense of there is some work that is you just have to do, even if you don't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's an aspect of a changing view that sees work as good. Yeah. So the both pieces of that, uh, if we don't get our kids to work, they're not equipped for either. Viewing work is good, but then also yeah. some of the necessary, whatever dirty stuff, like you said, <laughs> yeah. changing diaper. You actually you actually use the word poopy on our podcast here. And, <laughs> I hope that's the last time you use that oh, word. Shoot. Um, no, but yeah, that, that those are the, <laughs> the, the the some of those tasks that have to be done. Mm-hmm. And even, I mean, even getting to a place of maturity where you see changing diapers is a good thing. Uh, yeah. Did you ever get to that place as a mom? Did you ever? I don't think so. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, so you're lacking some maturity there, honey. Because I always, no, there... I always saw it as a, a part of my <laughs> wonderful duty as a dad. There are those, mo- actually, now that you, I mean, there are those moments where you, as an adult, you do pull back and say, no, this is good, what I'm doing. Yeah. This is good. And there are those moments as as we become parents that we have those moments where we reflect on our parents and we realize, oh my gosh, they did all this stuff for us. We had no idea they did. And so it lends this appreciation for our parents. Um, but also we realize, first of all, what we're capable of that we didn't realize we were capable of. And again, that goes back to the dignity thing of work, um, the dignity aspect of work. Um, but yeah, just to be able to pull back and say, wow, I I did a lot today. I, I'm just thinking about when, uh, when our kids were little and I'm at home and doing laundry and changing diapers and doing a lot of things that you just get up and do every day. But if you can pull back at times and say, no, this work is good. Mm-hmm. And even though a lot of people aren't seeing what I'm doing, um, the work is good, God's seeing it and what it's doing in just caring for others. And then also what it's doing in me, mm-hmm. how it's sanctifying me and growing me as a person um, is good. But. Yeah, so, uh, that that speaks, I think, to a level of maturity, right? Where you get to the point where you see uh, work as not just the means to another end, but as an end in itself. Yeah, uh, and the value of uh, of of work and in um, and that work is a good thing in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And in addition, it produces all these good things in us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is really, I think, the first step. And in a lot of our parenting as we raise our kids we often want them to do particular things we want to and we often want to just get to the practical stuff like hey give me the five steps to get my kid to you know do this (laughs) uh but it's so important in our parenting that we're constantly laying the the foundation of ideas what we might call the worldview foundation because our beliefs and our ideas and our knowledge play a very important role in motivating action. Mm -hmm. It's not the entire story, but it's a big part of the story. In fact, that's why Paul says in Romans 12 too, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there's a connection between, between action, transformation, 
and the renewing of our minds with, with God's truth. So that's why the first step here is communicate the biblical view, communicate the Christian worldview of work, and let that then become, I think, part of the culture of your home. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a culture, right, and the culture's influencing us. We've talked about how it, it negatively influences us, but uh, kind of what we need to be then doing is creating counter cultures in our family. And so we want to develop a culture of work in our home. And that does start with just the way we talk about it, the way we view work ourselves, if we want to kind of pass that on uh, to our kids. And then connected with that, with the ideas, with developing a culture of work in our homes, is then modeling yeah. these kind of things for our kids. So uh, not only do we talk about work this way, but we live this out. Um, the kids, Our kids get to see us working hard and not just working hard, but they get to see us enjoying it. They get to see, um, you know, mom when she's, you know, preparing a meal or dad when he's, you know, barbecuing food or that we're not begrudging these things. We're not uh, doing it with a horrible attitude, but they, they all, they see that we, uh, we live out this view of work in just the daily chores around the house for, for us. Yeah, I think, having modeling in mind and that can even be not that we model it to perfection but that we're modeling I'm almost, I'm almost there right i'm <laughs> almost i've almost modeled this to perfection right honey <laughs> right but no, so not that yeah that we would model but that we're even actually modeling doing things when we don't want to do and and i i know i've had this conversation i think with all of my children at some point of them saying there's you know there's something they don't want to do or oh i don't want to clean my room or oh do i have to do my chores before i get to go do this thing and i've had uh, the conversation many times of i do i do lots of things every day that i don't want to necessarily do i would rather sit and read a book i would rather go get a manicure. I would rather go do these things than wash dishes or prepare dinner or do laundry or whatever. But I do things every day that aren't necessarily what I want to do, um, but it's required, it's work, it's important, and so I do it um, to be faithful. So I think just even modeling and, and narrating that to them too, we do things all the time that we don't wanna do, but work has to be done first and and so yeah i think um and if dad's doing a job maybe dad's in a job that he doesn't love so much but sometimes saying to the kids i, I don't love the job i'm in maybe you hear me complaining about it sometimes but i do it because i love you guys and i take my job as a provider seriously and so i I get up for work every day and do this because it's important and because I, I need to do it. So anyway, yeah. just thinking of modeling that way too. Yeah, and I just want to affirm you right now publicly, Erin, that uh, you're a great model of this for our kids. <laughs> so I just want everyone to know I'm an eyewitness to her great modeling <laughs> for our children. Um, no, I, I, so seriously, the, the key point here is ironically the way to get your kids to work and value work and to ultimately do chores around the house, it actually starts with <laughs> yeah. us. Yeah, It starts with how we view it, how we live this out, which yeah. is so much of parenting. Is yeah. It starts with you and I. Uh, so we might need to grow in that area. Okay, so we spent <laughs> a lot of time on, on that first point of communicating the biblical worldview of work. All right, secondly, Here's a second step in how to help our kids do chores is you and I have talked a lot about this, Aaron, is you start young. Yeah. You start young. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, parents who hear this are going to say, well, okay, how, how young? young? <laughs> right. Uh, are you talking two, three? Are you talking 12? I mean, how young do you start when it comes to chores? Yeah, I, I do think around the age two, three, when they are walking. Like two years old. Two years old. Okay, all right. That they can Play start. Play this out for, for parents out there. Yeah, that they can start um, first just contributing to the messes that, to cleaning up the messes they make. 
So I think having their toys in uh, bins and things where they are able to throw it back in when they pull all their trains out or they pull all their cars out or dolls, whatever, that they're in containers that when it's time to clean up, that you can say, okay, now let's clean up. You're modeling for them what that looks like, but you're also having them contribute to that. So you're having them put their toys in things that are easy for them to do and to maybe pick up the tub and go put it away or put it back in the corner. And so they're learning, first of all, just to help to contribute in their own care. Um, and then also having them to start to contribute to family care. So setting the table for dinner. A two and three year old that can walk and hold things can carry plates to the table. Now, if you have glass plates. Yeah, I was gonna say, not, how about like your fine china? <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do people actually even have china anymore? I don't know. I don't That's think so. That's on the boomers. Do. We, we certainly don't. Um, it would never last it in our house. But yeah, so don't use glass plates or cups when you're first teaching a two year or three year old to set the table, use plastic plates, use paper plates. Um, I think it's a worthy sacrifice to make to get them in the habit of setting the table. They can put silverware out, put give daddy his fork, give mommy her fork, and set the cups on the table like this. And so just contributing to even things that aren't just for them, but are contributing to the family. Um, little ones can do little things, and they are little, but it's it's helping to train them in in helping them to have the mindset that, oh, this is normal. This yeah. is just a normal part of life. Okay, so the person out there, the mom or dad who is hearing this and is thinking too, like that woman's a slave driver, <laughs> which I mean, she is, you are in certain ways, but <laughs> but is thinking, isn't that too young? That um, or, or maybe, yeah, maybe they, they just, they haven't heard, someone say, get your two-year-old to work. I mean, wh wh why are you not a slave driver, honey? Why are you not a, uh, maybe are you, I mean, is this a little too intense? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we've had five kids to experiment on ourselves. Yeah, and... two out of the three didn't turn out well, but <laughs> three are okay. So we learned over time. So, no, I don't think so. I, I think, I think, Going back to the biblical view of work, I think it's dignifying. I think it's the opposite of some type of abuse or harassment. Again, little ones can do little things. They can't do big things. And you have to have the mindset, too, that actually them contributing won't necessarily be a help to you at first. It mm -hmm. actually is going to slow things down. When you have a two or three year old helping you set the table, this will automatically double your time of setting the table. When you have a four and five year old start to learn how to cut up vegetables for dinner, which I did this, I taught our four and five year olds how to use a knife so that in a safe way, but- Is that why uh, Micah <laughs> only has nine fingers? I Is knew that... you were gonna say something. <laughs> but I taught them how to use tools when they were ready some were, were ready at different times of course and some of the kids had more interest in like helping to cook or whatever so i i would teach them earlier but these are things as we're teaching them to work it will slow down our progress at home and it won't be kind of the perfect setup it wouldn't it won't, it be, won't be beautiful like you or me doing something it no. won't be that kind of quality no but i think it's important for parents to to understand your uh you know you're you're sacrificing maybe one thing like the quality of work that gets done <laughs> or the presentation of your food or yes. whatever for a greater good right and that's that your kids are learning how to love work embrace it see it as a good see that there's a way that they contribute to the, the family mm -hmm. through their work and uh, and so you have to be willing to make that sacrifice yeah. and that i think probably there are some parents out there who need to hear that very clearly because there's some of us as parents who are a little more on the control side mm -hmm. and we want everything to be nice and neat and perfect and so we'll just kind of like we'd rather just shoo our kids out of the kitchen yeah. or uh, or it's it's much faster if i clean up the toys for them yes. 
and I can put them away exactly how I want them. Yeah. And we need to let go of some of that. Yep. I, and I have had a hard time with that, just honestly. Yes, you have. More, <laughs> more than you. And there have been times where you have had to say, honey, don't do that for the kids. Make them do it. Oftentimes when I catch myself doing that, it's because I just want it done. I'm, I'm tired or whatever. I just, can we just do this quickly? Or if I do it, it will be done right. So let's just get this over with. Of course, there are times where where we just do things and and whatever. But as far as regular habits, I think we want to get into the regular habit as parents of letting go of something being done perfectly at first for, so that you develop this habit of work. And I think having the long-term goal, like we've talked about before, of teaching them to do these things well. And so when they become older and able-bodied, so by the time our kids are 10, 11, 12, and they're starting to become, you know, as tall as us, as big as, they, these are able-bodied human beings and a, a teenager, I mean, all of my kids, when by the time they're teenagers, they're taller than me, they're bigger than me. These are able-bodied people who can accomplish a lot and there, there should be no boundary, there should be no limits to what they can do. They should be equally engaging and work with us. But the only way to get there is to start having the three-year-old make their own bed so that by the time they're 10, when they make their bed, it looks really good. And you don't have to go back and fix it. Or by the time they're 10, when they scrub the toilet, it's actually clean. As opposed to when they started when they were five and we taught them how to do it. And then we went and cleaned it for real before company came over or whatever. Yeah. So, and I mean, think about how how uh, great that feels when you can cultivate that that work ethic in your kid. And, and they get to the point where they're actually better at some of this stuff than yeah. than we are um yeah we're essentially in some ways working ourselves out of jobs right and and i've gotten that question from moms of it just seems like you know you're it's like we're, i'm just handing off house jobs to the kids yeah. and in some a ways amen. in some ways <laughs> yeah we are working ourselves out of a job here but it, it's with the mindset of we're we are training them for life, we're training them for the dignifying thing of moving out of our home and having all assurances that they can care for themselves and then down the road for a family. Yeah, okay, so uh, so first thing is communicate biblical view of work. Second thing is start young, mm -hmm. develop that culture young. Uh, and I think I, we could probably do a, a future podcast on the challenge of kind of work with older kids and chores with older kids because there's you know sports and school and, and these other pressures of, of a busy life but um, but if you the, the younger you start and you build this into the culture of your family so that it's it's really kind of normalized mm -hmm. the easier it is as the kids get older that yeah. this is just a part of what you do as a member of this family and it's a good thing and it's something I can contribute to the family. And so what we see in our older kids now is they don't they don't begrudge when we ask them to do work for the family. It's just become part of a, hopefully a healthy view of work in our, our family culture. Okay, so two more steps here uh, we wanna get to. Number three, we've talked about creating a chore list. Uh, so we have a very specific list of chores for each kid. And uh, we've kind of, customize that we've tailored it where Micah has his chore list when Lexi was at home she had her chore list Paige Ella and Jonah they each have their chore list we break it down kind of Monday through Friday uh, of things that they are to accomplish each day mm -hmm. so for instance uh, cleaning the the windows on the French doors uh, that's you know Micah and Jonah do that together on whatever it is Tuesdays and uh, you know maybe it's mopping the floor is a you know Wednesday chore, cleaning the bathroom or whatever. But the point is, we give a specific outline of those chores, mm -hmm. kind of what day they're expected to be done. Of course, there's always grace and room for adjusting that based upon our our family's um, schedule. But 
I think creating a chore list, what it does is it helps to just lay out the expectations. Like here are the expectations. And then you've got this list that can be printed out each week. It becomes a helpful tool so that mom and dad aren't having to kind of harp on these things or give the weekly reminders. Mm -hmm. And the kids can have that list. And then we have put a little box on there where they can check that off. And having a specific chore list has been a helpful tool in uh, our home. Yeah, for sure. And it, I think we, we got clipboards for the kids for when the chore list was printed out, they could put it on their on their own clipboard. They still do that. And, and then, yeah, they're just keeping track of chores and and that's connected with then how we we um, teach them about money, which we're going to talk about. But yeah, I think having a list or something that they can look at and remember what they're supposed to do um, is important. And I think too with the list, it it helps to well f- for me. I think about the chores that we've assigned our kids, and we for the most part they have their daily things that they do. And then every day there's one or two things that is a weekly chore. Um, so they're not repeating it like like doing the the windows or whatever. But and the good thing about them doing this regularly too is that when I see the French doors haven't been cleaned, when I see that my room hasn't been vacuumed, when I see the floor hasn't been mopped. I know which kid hasn't been keeping up. We know who with, to blame. We know exactly who to blame. <laughs> and I can- Or s- hold accountable. That's <laughs> what, really what we mean, hold accountable. So then when they're asking to do something, oh, can I go outside now and play? I can I can see right away too. Um, and that's just the benefit of creating the habit of it, mm-hmm. of just knowing um, who's kind of responsible for what in the home and and then as mom and dad, how we're able to really kind of oversee that. Yeah. And some of our kids, I mean, our kids have had some of these chores for years and years and years. So they've gotten quite good at them. And then, um, yeah, again, I just, I know when the trash is overflowing, I just say, Micah. Micah, that's Micah. I, it's Micah, it's we Micah. know it's Micah. So, you know, there's things like that, that we know when the bathroom, when the guest bathroom isn't clean, we say, Paige, you know, we know because this is just yeah, just and, their thing. And the kids have actually, they've trade, traded chores at times. <laughs> They're like, hey, I don't like that one as much. You're better at that one. So I'll trade you this chore for this chore. And so we've switched it up on the list. <laughs> but- uh, Family I, of negotiators. That's but. right. Um, one thing though that I, I as we do our chore list it's not comprehensive like not all the work that needs to be done in the home is on that list and so here's the reason i say this is because we've also communicate communicated to our kids that there are other things uh, and other obligations in the family that we're not we just can't have a comprehensive list of all the different kind of work that needs to be done and so there'll be times where we need to do you know uh maybe we're doing Christmas dinner or family, uh, is, is we've invited another family over for dinner and there's some special setup we have to do and mm-hmm. we have ask everyone to pitch in. Um, so not all the work is on that chore list. And so we also communicate, hey, there's additional chores that are just part of being a family, but we'll, you know, we'll take those as they come. Okay, so that's number three. And then the very fourth thing that we do to try and help develop work ethic and chores in our house is and you mentioned this aaron is connect money with the chores Mm -hmm. and really it's it's connecting work and pay work you work and there's a reward for that and i think that is um is a reality for adults we work so that we we have we can make money for our family so we can provide so we can buy things and so I think this is a healthy way to start teaching kids about money. And actually, as I've thought about it, I'm not sure how else to teach kids the value of money without connecting it to work. Mm. Because if kids are just given money for being alive, <laughs> I'm not sure how they make the connection then that, that work is required for what us all of us adults know that if we want to have a place to live, if we want to buy food, if we want to have a car and go on vacation, we have to work for these things. So are you against the idea of an allowance 
right? That's what we've traditionally called it, or not we, but Americans have called it an allowance, right? You can give your kid whatever, yeah, uh, a certain amount of money each week. Would well, you? I'm not a. I I I wouldn't want to be confrontational and say <laughs> I'm against it. Aaron, um, you guys, you get to know Aaron. <laughs> she likes to avoid conflict. <laughs> Um, I no, just, she's just you're just easygoing. You don't want to you don't want to make people ups, upset out there. But for those who are saying, and maybe someone has figured out how to give people money for free and not connect it to work, and it's are, taught them somehow how money works. The U.S. government I, <laughs> has figured that out. Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, we are not going there right now. But I think I'm just again. I thought about this, and I I do not know how else. We teach our kids that if you want things, if if you want to be able to buy things, you have to work. Yeah. And this has helped us, I think, in teaching our kids about money and also in learning to have a little bit of self-control. For example, um, every time we go to Target or you know, some kind of store, there's things that our kids want to buy. And so you'll, you know, I hear it all the time. Of course, I've experienced it with my own children. You're there and they're begging, oh, can I buy this? Can I buy this? Can I buy this? Well, if you start even at three years old of having them do little things and then paying them for those things, then when you're at Target and they're asking for a new baby doll or a Star Wars thing or a Lego set, you are you are connecting with, okay, actually you can earn this. And so let's do, if you do your chores, okay, this Lego set costs $15. If you do your chores for the next three weeks or whatever, then you will be able to come here and buy this Lego set on your own. Yeah. But otherwise don't ask mommy and daddy it's not your birthday and it's not christmas so otherwise why would we buy toy you know things like this are a privilege and so unless you work for it and you're able to buy it yourself then then you wouldn't be asking for it and i have seen in our kids that when they start to learn this when they're old enough to learn oh money and i have to earn it then we don't have the fits at target we're having the conversations about well, if I work hard enough, then I can earn it. Yeah. Sometimes and mom still has the fits at Target. <laughs> um, when I have to say is, no, I'm honey. Target you have to is earn very. That. It is hard to say no at Target, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah. No. I, well, I think but, I actually think what you're saying is is a really key point because uh, it, it really is help, and I think it can, it can be a really good tool to help parents um, kind of knock out that that tantrum. Yeah. Right. That. Every one of us has seen our our kids have been a part of that. You know, we've experienced that tantrum with the kid where they see something they want it. I want that, mommy, buy that for me, daddy, buy that for me, and we say no, and then you know they go off the rails. Um, what our response, and again, early starting this early sets the tone. Mm -hmm. But you start it early and you say, well, do you have enough money for that? You mm -hmm. know, have have you? If you work hard, you could you could actually buy that. And of course, there's a whole another side discussion about helping them to, um, you know, buy the right kinds of things. Sometimes we say even no, even if they have their own money. <laughs> but the general lesson here yeah. is, hey, I can work hard. And then there's there's a, a reward yeah. for that. And that teaches real life that when I work hard, there are benefits. And that's yeah. okay. That's not a selfish thing. Mm -mm. That's a self-interested thing. Yeah. And there's, there's appropriate self-interest. Yeah. And I think at, we have seen in our kids when they save up to buy something, especially something big. But I, I remember in particular, one of our kids, the first time she bought something at Target, we do go to Target a lot. When yeah. when she, and just, you know, she counted out her money and she slowly passed it over to the cashier and walked out and just, she just felt so good that she had just bought herself something that she really wanted and she had saved up for it. And so I think that, again, speaks to the dignity that that brings to a person. Um, and then also just a good sense of pride of like, wow, I, I did this. And then a whole nother discussion we could have too of just appreciating 
the thing that you get. I mean, we all know that when we have to save for and buy something, and when we when we really work hard to do that, um, we appreciate the things that we sacrifice for a yeah, lot. Yeah, those are those are two huge benefits: the dignity that a kid can feel, and I and you you know you 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 said pride in, in the good sense. There's mm-hmm. a there's a good sense of the word pride. Yeah, uh, and maybe maybe think of it in terms of confidence. Right. There's a confidence that a kid can grow in like, hey, I can work hard. I can earn this Mm -hmm. and I can kind of take care of myself, which is ultimately the goal is we send our kids out from our home. We want them to be able to take care of themselves. Uh, We want them to grow up and to mature. And and, and that starts very young. And so then the other thing you mentioned was um, the uh, what did you just mention? was the other benefit you just mentioned. The the, uh, appreciating it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the appreciating it. That's that that's a third benefit of just this ownership now. Mm-hmm. This is their thing. They invested in it and you know what? That motivates you to take care of it better. Yeah. You know, I I'm I'm maybe not going to take that toy that I got for free or was a gift and just treat it however. No, I've put some hard work and sweat and in I've got some ownership in this and we know when people have ownership of something they tend to take better care of it mm-hmm. and uh, because if it breaks then they they feel that loss yeah. more so there's a healthy sense of ownership so there's some real benefits to connecting uh work uh chores mm-hmm. with money and it's a, it's a it's a healthy incentive yeah uh, doesn't mean you can't do allowance but I mean, just frankly speaking, we, we've never done allowance in our home. Wouldn't be against it in principle, but I think you're right. It, it's been such a good tool for us to help uh, teach our kids to do work and um, and to motivate them to do chores. And yeah. that's part of motivating that you know, you're fighting fallen human nature that <laughs> tends towards laziness and uh, money is a good incentive. Yeah. So anyway, those are, okay, so those are four practical ways. We could probably explore these a lot more, and we will, we'll, we'll say more about these, uh, this area of life in future podcasts. But those are four really, I, th- I think, good, some, some good practical and theoretical ways in which to help our kids not just do chores, but eventually to build a work ethic. And um, so hopefully that's been helpful for you. If you have any questions, if you have follow-up questions, uh, or you say, hey, look, Brett, Aaron, you didn't address this enough, and you want us to do a future podcast on a topic related to this, uh, or just have questions, uh, email us. Email us at info at maventruth.com. And, uh, and we'll hopefully take some of your questions in future podcasts and uh, it'll help us know how we can best help you. So how are we gonna, how are we, we're supposed to wrap this up, Aaron. I was waiting for you to just dive right in and be like, <laughs> I thought thank you, you. I thought you were going to bring it home. Well, I, I, I was bringing it, bring home, it home and then you're going to land the plane. Kunkel. You are going to land the plane right <laughs> now. So see you next time. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.